All right, well, as I've already said this morning, the text, or I should say the sermon, is going to be somewhat topical, so it's not going to deal with the exposition of any one particular verse, but touching, it will really touch on what we saw in Romans 1, and what we heard in Romans 11, verse 6, and what we're going to hear now from Romans 4, verses 1 through 8, the passage we've already gone through. And what we're focusing on this morning, again, is the gospel reveals to us God's free grace, His, His mercy and His love, and reminds us there's nothing we can do to bring this love down to ourselves. It's something that God has provided purely out of His grace. So Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 8, Paul writes this. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, is found? For if Abraham was justified by works, and remember justification means God receives him as one who is in fact just, who is perfect, okay? If Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, to the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, as grace, but as what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing on the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven, and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. Now again, you know, we've heard so many messages on, on the Reformation, on the discovery of the gospel in Luther's time. We tend to take this for granted, but one thing we want to think about this morning is that we can still fall into the same trap. Remember what Luther said to his congregation? Or actually, I, I'm not sure if he wrote it, or I remember what, hearing he said this, or where he wrote it. Every week I preach the gospel to my people because every week they forget it, okay? And we tend to do the same thing, even though we're not steeped in as much legalism as they were, well, there's other forms that we can fall into. And so that's, again, one of the things we're going to address uh, this morning. But by way of introduction, I just wanted to say this, first of all, that we all know what time of year it is. You know, we, we know that there's a couple of competing things, uh, competing for our attention at this time of the year, for instance, tomorrow. Most of the Western world is going to be celebrating a holiday, but that holiday is not the one we're celebrating. They're going to be celebrating Halloween. Okay, they're going to be carving their pumpkins, dressing up in costumes, going trick-or-treating, participating in carnivals and parties. And one of the questions I asked myself as, as I was preparing this particular sermon was, why? Why do they do that? If we ever ask that question, we just kind of grew up with it, and we expect it, right? It's just the norm. Well, it's interesting that it all began with a Celtic harvest festival called Samhain. During this time of the year, October the 31st, which is tomorrow, the Celts believe that the boundary between this world and the other world, the world beyond, uh, the world of spirits, thinned, allowing the spirits more easily to be able to pass into this existence. Now, there were two types of spirits that came. Threatening spirits called fairies, what's left over from what they believed uh, were the gods, who weren't exactly friendly, so they would appease them with offerings of food and drink. You know, think about the monsters that come to your door. <laughs> <laughs> on, on Halloween and, and how you send them away with, with candy. I mean, where did that practice come from? Well, it sounds like it probably came from this one. But uh, they also, besides these spirits, there were also the souls of dead relatives that passed into this realm for whom the Celts would prepare a place at the table to welcome them. And I think in this case, think Day of the Dead. Day of the Dead celebrations that take place in Mexico and Latin America when do they take place? Well, not tomorrow, but the next day and the next day. So November the 1st through the 3rd typically is when that takes place. Okay, so that's where that practice comes from. Now, a Christian holiday also originated in the church, a vigil 
that is observed on the evening of All Saints Day. Now, All Saints Day is, is November the 1st. And it's the day when the church celebrates all the church saints, whether they know them or don't know them. Uh, it's a day for them, you know, in case they missed any. Now, the evening before, the day before, is called All Saints Eve or All Hallows Eve or has come to be known Halloween. And at this, some point in history, these two traditions seem to have merged and the Celtic tradition was given the name Halloween. All right, that's just sort of an interesting oddity, okay? But I bring that up to say that for us, tomorrow, though it be Halloween, has another name which is more important to us, and that is Reformation Day. Because it was on this day in the year 1517 that an Augustinian monk by the name of Martin Luther, intending to call for a debate on the abuse of indulgences, nailed his 95 theses to the church door in Wittenberg, igniting uh, the flames of Reformation. Now, on this day, you know, uh, typically what we do is look back on God's goodness and mercy. Not only because he made his gospel again clear to his church that we are justified by grace through faith alone, which interpreted means this, that out of God's infinite love, he forgives us and accepts us freely as a gift of his grace into his family forever if we will only believe and trust in his son. We rejoice in the fact that that's now again made clear, but we also rejoice in the fact that at that same time God raised up a man who had the gifts and the courage to proclaim this truth to the world at the risk of his own life. Now, what I'd like to do this morning is briefly revisit how the Lord applied the gospel of his free grace to Luther in his day and how we can use it to address the issues that we have to face today. In other words, we want to see how we can use the gospel of God's free grace in every area of life. Now, let's begin with Luther's situation. By his day, we know the church had fallen away from its apostolic foundation and had embraced many false teachings. The clergy were forbidden to marry, and that tempted many of them to fall into immorality. Mary and the saints were seen as mediators between man and Christ. Instead of Christ being the mediator between man and God, we needed mediators who would be able to bring us to Jesus because he was so austere uh, and wrathful that he might not receive us. And so the people were tempted to venerate Mary and the saints. The Pope was seen as the vicar of Christ, the head of the church on earth, who spoke infallibly on matters of faith and morals. And believing this, the people hung on his every word, even when it contradicted scripture, but of course they didn't know what scripture said, so they were kind of at his mercy. Purgatory was seen as a necessary evil to satisfy the, te the temporal punishments of sin. And it led the people to work very diligently trying to satisfy for their sins while they were on earth through the giving of money, alms, and through good works. Transubstantiation, the teaching that the bread and the wine and the Lord's Supper were miraculously transformed into the real body and blood of Christ led the people to commit idolatry because when these elements were present, they would kneel before them and they would worship them. Now, of course, all this was compounded by the fact that the church was withholding God's word from the people. And it made the people dependent on the church to learn what God said. But the problem was the church was teaching them error. And so they, re they remained in this superstitious ignorance. Now, the most dangerous error, of course, of the church at that time was their view of salvation. They believe that we are justified or accepted by God by His grace. They believe in, in again, justification by grace alone. That's what they say because they know that we can't do it apart from God's grace from His help that is provided for us through the sacraments. But they also believed it is by works. 
that we have to cooperate with God's help. We receive this help, and with that energy that it gives us, with that desire to serve God that it gives us, we serve Him, and as we're serving Him, we are perfecting our lives. And the goal is, of course, to, to reach the point where we are perfect. And when we are perfect, personally perfect, then God will declare us to be what we actually are, and that is just. But He won't do it unless we are just. And if we aren't when we die, which is true of most people, it was off to purgatory to suffer for tens of thousands, millions, or even billions of years until you can become good enough to enter into heaven. Now, this adding of works to God's salvation is the same problem that the Pharisees had. As a matter of fact, it's a problem that has existed throughout church history. They believed that God had given to them the ceremonial law and the Ten Commandments to be a system of works and sacrifice by which they would make themselves acceptable to Him. This is the error that Paul has to address again and again in Scripture, the Pharisaical error. Now, sadly, as I've said before, some Protestants also fall into this same error that God will not receive us until we reach a certain level of sanctification, even though you know, we don't necessarily believe that. We don't believe it. We don't teach it. There are some churches that believe that, that well, salvation is essentially our choice to receive Christ, and then we have to kind of keep ourselves in the grace of Christ by continually working. Well, it leads to this kind of a view that if I don't reach a certain level, I can't really be convinced that God has received me. You know, Finney believed that we're justified by grace through faith alone. But when you read his works, you see that he believed we only remain justified as long as we live a perfect life. And if you sin in the slightest, you lose your justification. And you have to be justified, you have to be saved all over again. And there are people who believe this in varying degrees today, sometimes in reform circles. We can create similar problems for ourselves when we doubt that God has saved us because we're just not good enough. And so we try to convince ourselves that He has saved us by doing good works. So again, works, works keeps getting injected into the system. Now, these types of views, you know, it was basically the, this view of, of works having to make myself good enough that eventually led Luther to despair because he was always asking himself the question, am I good enough? Have I done enough? The, well, the answer, of course, was no. Have I sinned and lost my justification in the case of those that follow Finney? The ultimate question is, if I die right now, will I go to heaven or will I go to hell? Now listen to what Luther writes regarding his own experience. And the interesting thing about this quote, which comes from the preface to his works, is he mentions that in 1519 he, he felt this way about himself, saw himself in a condemned condition. 1519. When did he nail those theses to the church door? 1517. Okay, was, did Luther consider himself a converted man when he nailed those theses to the church door? No. And that's not what the theses were about. It was about abuse of church indulgences. It wasn't about the use of them. Luther had still not discovered the gospel for himself, but in 1519 he did. Now this is what he writes regarding his subjective you know, experience before conversion. He says, meanwhile in that same year, 1519, I had begun interpreting the Psalms once again. I felt confident that I was now more experienced since I had dealt in university courses with St. Paul's letters to the Romans, to the Galatians, and the letter to the Hebrews. I had conceived a burning desire to understand what Paul meant in his letter to the Romans, but thus far there had stood in my way not the cold blood around my heart, but that one word which is in chapter 1, the justice of God is revealed in it. I hated that word, justice of God, which by the use and custom of all my teachers I had been taught to understand philosophically 
as referring to the formal or active justice, as they call it, that justice by which God is just and by which he punishes sinners and the unjust. But I, blameless monk that I was, felt that before God, I was a sinner with an extremely troubled conscience. I couldn't be sure that God was appeased by my satisfaction. I did not love, no, rather I hated the just God who punishes sinners in silence. If I did not blaspheme, then certainly I grumbled vehemently and got angry at God. I said, isn't it enough that we miserable sinners, lost for all eternity because of original sin, are oppressed by every kind of calamity through the Ten Commandments? Why does God heap sorrow upon sorrow through the gospel and through the gospel threaten us with his justice and his wrath? This was how I was raging with wild and disturbed conscience. I constantly badgered St. Paul about that spot in Romans 1 and anxiously wanted to know what he meant. Okay, so that was Luther's experience. You can see how salvation by works drives you to despair. You're, you're not going to be good enough. But then Luther finishes this quote by showing us how you know, God, by his grace, revealed to him what the gospel really meant and what he was really offering through it. I meditated night and day on those words until at last, by the mercy of God, I paid attention to their context. The justice of God is revealed in it as it is written, the just person lives by faith. I began to understand that in this verse, the justice of God is that by which the just person lives, by a gift of God, that is by faith. I began to understand that this verse means that the justice of God is revealed through the gospel, but it is a passive justice, that by which the merciful God justifies us by faith. As it is written, the just person lives by faith. All at once I felt that I had been born again and entered into paradise itself through open gates. Immediately I saw the whole of Scripture in a different light. I ran through the Scriptures from memory, wouldn't that be wonderful, huh? and found that other terms had analogous meanings. The work of God, that is what God works in us. The power of God, by which he makes us powerful. The wisdom of God, by which he makes us wise. The strength of God, the salvation of God, the glory of God. Now you see, the antidote to the legalism that Luther faced in his day, and that which we face in our own, is the gospel of God's free grace. That God justifies not the righteous who are righteous in and of themselves, but as Paul says in Romans 4, God justifies the ungodly. If we're despairing that God will ever receive us, what we need to do is come to Christ and freely receive the grace which he offers, the righteousness, his personal righteousness, imputed to us by faith. God credits, credits it to us when we trust in Jesus Christ because that righteousness alone will make us acceptable to God. Now, we all understand that that's what Reformation Day is about. That's what the Reformation is about, the rediscovery of the gospel. But one thing I want us to focus on for the remainder of the sermon is to realize that after we come to Christ, we still need the gospel. And again, not just repent and believe. That's, that's an aspect of the gospel. That's the command of the gospel. And not just we are saved by grace through faith alone or we are justified in that way, but, but filling it out a little bit more and remembering the gospel is all about God's love and his mercy and grace towards us in Christ, that God is for us. We never outgrow our dependence upon that. Now, we need it for every aspect of our lives, and obviously I can't deal with all of them, but I would like to deal with a few that I thought will be helpful. First of all, we need the gospel for our assurance. All that Jesus is, all that he offers, all of his love, he gives to those who trust in him. We know that from Scripture. We're just reminded of that from Luther's experience. 
But I would wager at some point we all ask our, ourselves, have I really trusted him? You know, that, that's the assurance question, isn't it? Have I really trusted Jesus or am I deceiving myself? Well, how can I know? You know, there's, there's two, two uh, camps in, in the church and there's a debate that's ongoing between what's usually the continental reformed and those more of a Puritan persuasion. Do I look in myself for the marks of grace? Do I look to Christ? Okay, well, the answer to the question is you do both. Uh, now, Richard Sibbs is going to focus on looking to Christ more, but I think there's a reason why that works. And it's because by doing that, we actually, those marks of grace are strengthened and we can see them more clearly. Now, there's really only one difference between the believer and the unbeliever. One difference. Believers love God and they love Christ because they have the Spirit of God. Unbelievers have neither the Spirit nor this love. So if we want to know that we belong to Christ, that we have savingly trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, we, we have not only to have this love in our heart, but we have to see it and know that it is love for God and His holiness. Now, the problem that the, re, that the continental reformers point out or the continental uh, reform tradition is that when we look into our hearts, we can have a hard time seeing that love in our hearts because there's a lot of sin that's still there. So the question then is, what do we do? Well, the standard answer, of course, from the Puritans is, well, still look for that love because if you have it, you're a Christian no matter how much sin you find. And that, that is certainly true. But there's another way that you can do it. And that is by strengthening the love that is there. Because the stronger it is, the easier it's going to be to see. Well, how can we strengthen it? Through the gospel. That's exactly what we're going to hear this evening. By focusing our attention upon Christ. Well, what about him? His beauty, not his physical beauty, but his moral beauty, okay? his character, his glory, I mean, Jesus is glorified, even his glory was seen even on earth, the, the glory of the only begotten who is born of God, who displays for us the very character of God. That is glorious, that's wonderful. But of course, that which we think about the most is his love and his grace. Now, I have to be very sketchy here because we still have a little ground to cover. Sibs is going to paint that picture for us tonight, and it's, it's a wonderful picture. Puritans had a way of doing it that um, I don't think we can attain to today. But as we focus upon Christ and all these things about Him, our affections for Him will intensify and they will be drawn out to Him because of the Spirit's work in our hearts. Okay, if we don't have the Spirit of God, it doesn't matter how much we meditate on Him, we're not going to love Him. We need the Spirit. Okay? So if we have the Spirit, this will work. Our love will grow stronger, we'll feel those affections more strongly, and then we will see them more clearly, and that will show us that we really do belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope you can see that's a combination of those two views. I think we really do need both. But along with stoking the flame, so to speak, by meditating on Christ, spending time with Him, and getting to know Him, we also need to make sure that we don't let our hearts also go after the world, because these two are in competition with each other. The more we love the world, the less we're going to love Christ. And conversely, the more we love Christ, the less the world. We have to stay clear of the world. Otherwise, it's going to quench those flames and our assurance is going to go down. And we don't want that. We need to keep our eyes fixed upon the Lord Jesus Christ. We need the gospel for assurance. Secondly, we need the gospel for sanctification. How can we, who know we belong to the Lord Jesus, how can we have our heart's desire, which is to become more like Him? That's what sanctification is all about. And how can we do more for Him? Well, the answer is through the gospel. The only way we're going to do more for Him is if we love Him more. Remember how we saw in Romans chapter 9 what motivated the Apostle Paul? His love for his family you know, uh, the Jews, that God loved them and gave them such blessings, but also the love of Christ in his heart, okay? 
That's what drove Paul to do all that he did. He was the most industrious man outside of our Lord Jesus Christ who <clears throat> has ever lived. But he was because of love. And if we love him more, we will do more. But how do we love him more? Again, we have to spend more time with him. Same thing with regard to assurance. Think about the gospel. Think about what he has done for us. The gospel, again, is is the account of all that God has done for us in Christ. It's not just the command, repent and believe. The gospel has a broader application. So we need to remember those things. And again, we'll see more of that this evening. Third, we need the gospel to help us avoid antinomianism. Okay, and that's the opposite of legalism. That's also a very real problem for Christians, especially when there is a strong emphasis on God's grace. You know, there are some Christian communions where grace is so emphasized that it squeezes out the need to obey. You know, Jesus has done it all. We don't need to do anything. And I've told you before, the college that Don and I attended was very much of this mindset. Their reasoning was this. If we are justified by grace through faith alone, then adding works in any way and saying that they must be there is um, basically destroying grace. I mean, doesn't Paul say that if it is by, you know, if it's by grace, it can't be by works, otherwise grace is no longer grace. Well, we know Luther and the Reformers believed that justification was by God's free grace. It was received, you know, by faith alone, and there were no works involved in it because that's legalism. But they were equally convinced that his grace or his spirit within us will produce obedience. Okay, we know that that's true. Scripture agrees. James tells us, for just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. And no, that dead faith will not save you. Okay, James is distinguishing a true faith from the faith of demons. John writes this in 1 John 3.10. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. Could we want, I mean, could we ask for anything clearer than that? Okay? If, if we are born of God, if we are his children, okay, we will practice righteousness, including loving God our brother. Jesus, in his work, not only came to free us from condemnation from the sentence of hell, but also from the power of sin so that we might obey him out of love. Wouldn't it be cruel if the Lord Jesus Christ had come and left us in the same condition in which he found us? You know, this is the reason why he gives us the Holy Spirit, so that we can share of his same joy and pleasure in this love relationship with God, which he will not have with those practicing sin, okay? Jesus came to make us to be more like him. And that's what the gospel reminds us of. So we don't fall into the, the error of antinomianism. You know, people who believe they don't have to obey God, who think that they've come forward at a you know, some kind of a service, pray to prayer, they were earnest and so forth, and yet they leave the church and abandon Christ, they're not saved. And yet they are led to believe that they are. That's the cruelty, okay? Because those people are going to be condemned unless they're truly born again and begin to love the Lord from the heart, the evidence of which is going to be following him. Again, the gospel reminds us of that. The gospel is Jesus came to free us from both the guilt and power of sin. Now, fourth, we need the gospel to be able to extend forgiveness towards others. By the way, there's, there's an endless list of what we need the gospel for. I'm just going to point these few out. Now, it reminds us that, you know, how much God loved us and how much he has forgiven us and so how we are obligated to forgive others. That's something we, we focus on in the Lord's Prayer. But it also comforts us that God is going to balance the scales of justice, okay, with regard to those who have, a, you know, that are our enemies who have injured us in some way, giving us a reason why we can be merciful and forgiving. 
whatever anybody has done to us, if they come to Christ, if Christ has died for them, that sin is already paid for. And obviously, we don't want to exact a double payment by seeking retribution ourselves. Christ, you know, has paid for that sin. And of course, if that person truly has come to the Lord, one thing they will want to do is ask our forgiveness for having injured us in the way they have. But even if they never come to the Lord Jesus Christ, the gospel reminds us that they will ultimately pay for that crime, won't they? I mean, God's going to hold everyone accountable for all the sins they've ever committed. Those who are in Christ, he did it at the cross. Those who are outside of Christ, he will do it, as we know, in hell forever. And that's the reason why God says to us, through the Apostle Paul, do not take your own revenge, because God is going to repay, either through the cross or through eternal punishment. And again, that's what the cross reminds us of. And then finally, and I, I wanted to bring this one in because I think it's practical, but it's also something that Luther said to Melanchthon that is misunderstood, and I want to make sure that we understand what he meant by that. And Luther, in this example, shows us how the gospel helps indecision. Indecision in what to do as far as knowing God's will and if you don't know it quite well. There are times when, you know, we're faced with a choice and we, we search God's word, looking for his wisdom, but we're still not quite clear that we know his mind or his will on it. Now, in most instances, we shouldn't do anything, we shouldn't act until we can do it in faith, until we know clearly what his will is. But there are times when it's better to choose if it's not outright evil, of course, we're never to choose that, but something we're not quite clear on even if our choice isn't perfect or in, is going to end up not being perfect. Now, after the Diet of, of Worms, you know, in 1521, where Luther stood before the, the, uh, uh, the magistrate, the, the, uh, the electors, when he was condemned and declared an outlaw, he went into hiding. And during this time, reforms were being carried out, as we know, by his associates in Wittenberg. And one of those was Philip Melanchthon. Now, on one occasion, when he was uncertain about which way to go, Luther wrote to him, encouraging him to make a choice. Because in this case, not to act would be sinful. Even though knowing if he did, the results would be less than perfect, and so still sinful in some degree. It was in that circumstance that Luther said to Philip, or he wrote to him, sin boldly, Philip. Now, some people take that to mean that Luther says, hey, you know, since we're saved by grace through faith, uh, we can sin and we shouldn't worry about it, sin boldly, just, you know, don't let conscience hold you back. Well, that's not what he's telling Melanchthon at all. What he meant was, okay, either way you choose uh, Philip, it's not going to be as perfect as you like. I don't know if you knew Philip Melanchthon was somewhat of a perfectionist, and some of us are. And sometimes if we don't have absolute certainty, we're not going to act. But he was locked in uncertainty. Luther said to him, choose the best way and move forward for Christ's glory because doing nothing would be worse than acting on something you think is less than perfect. So how can you do something like that? Well, again, the gospel is the way we can because when we're faced with choices like this, when we really don't know with absolute certainty that that's the right thing to do, although, again, not something we know clearly is wrong, that God forbids, but something we're not quite clear on, we need to remember that in, for all of our imperfections, Christ has died for us. All of our past, present, and future, including our imperfect attempts to serve Him. He loves us. He forgives us. And he will even help us to learn from our mistakes. Now, finally, let's not forget the gospel has one other purpose, and that's the most obvious one, and that is to lead unbelievers to faith in Christ. And as we think about the gospel of free grace, we need to remember that there's a lot of people who still have not been reached with it. I was looking at the statistics, and I guess the last time a poll was taken that would have allowed us to, or allowed the, the government to know how many people are actually professing Christians. In 2020, 64% of 
okay, of the United States, of the citizens of the United States, I'm assuming that means those that are here legally. I suppose many of the uh, illegal pe people who are illegally coming from South America and Mexico would probably answer yes to this question as well. So we could probably, you know, make it even higher. 64% of these people, only 36%, say that they're not Christians. Now, if that's true, then two out of every three people that you meet that are total strangers to you, statistically speaking, are true believers, or should say are believers. Now, should we believe this? <laughs> now, if that were true, would we be in the situation that we're in today? Okay, well, I don't think that's quite likely. So we need to realize that most of the people who claim to be Christians are not born-again Christians, but they are Christians in name only, what we call nominal Christians, and what that means is you add many of those, probably the majority of those, to the 36%. And most people in our culture need to hear the gospel. So what do we do? Well, obviously we need to begin with some with apologetics. And again, just briefly, point out the evidence God gives for his existence. There's plenty of it. They already have enough to leave them without excuse. Point those things out to bring them face to face with God. And then give the arguments to show the Bible is his word. You may need to do that with some people, not with everyone. With everyone, we do need to bring the law. We need to remember the law does have a purpose before we come to faith in Christ. It's not just meant for our sanctification, you know, to help us know how to love but it's also to point out our lack of love when we were loveless, to put it that way. Uh, we need to explain God's law so the people will see their failure and their need for the Savior. Isn't that what John the Baptist did when he went out preaching? He didn't go out and say, God loves you. You know, Israel, God has elected you. He's adopted you. Uh, what he said was, repent, because there's one coming who's going to baptize you with fire if you don't. Okay. That doesn't sound too loving, but it actually is. Okay, that, I'm, I'm sure John the Baptist did this out of a love and concern for Israel. And we need to do the same for those that we encounter, but we need to do it out of love. You know, our purpose is not to condemn them, but our purpose is to show them that they're condemned already and they need a savior. But let's not forget, they need to hear the gospel of God's free grace in Christ. And by the word free, you understand it's free. It's a gift, a gift of God's grace. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to work for it. He gives it freely if they will simply trust in the Lord Jesus. I say simply. No one in their own strength can do that, but those whom the Lord has chosen, he will give that strength. And so we don't have to worry about the fact that people can't do that. We just simply need to present the message and invite them to do so, even command them to do so, but out of love. This is the message, the gospel of God's free grace that the Spirit of God makes powerful to save. So all this is to say this, that as the world prepares to celebrate Halloween tomorrow in order to feed the monsters that come to their door, okay, let's remember the event, okay, when the Lord again revealed to us the gospel of his free grace. And let's remember that we need it as much as anyone else. We need it as medicine to cure every spiritual ill that we have and to help us grow in Christ. But they need it in order to find him. Well, let's, uh, let's spend just a moment in prayer, shall we, as we prepare to, to come to this memorial of Christ's love for us in the supper.